Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending. Additional support is provided by Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, and Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Aerial Property Advisors, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Goldman Properties, Moynian Group, Must Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Rosewood Realty Group, Terra CRG, Triangle Equities. So it's, it's called Queens. It's the borough. It's one of the most populated boroughs in the city of New York. It's a place where there's a lot of activity going on. There's retail, there's residential. So I really wanted to bring together today people who understand what's happening in Queens. And I have the four experts. My guests, they include Barry Radofsky, who's a managing member at Bronstein Properties, Manny Malikin, who's the principal at Malachite uh, Holdings, uh, Elias Theodoropoulos, who is the principal of Intercontinental Financial. And last but not least, the true executive producer of today's show, my good friend, Tom Donovan, who's a partner at Massey and Ackle Realty Services. So, Mr. Donovan, you know, you brought all these people together because you sell them buildings. So how's the business today in the borough of Queens, and just in general? Uh, Is it happy days are here again? Uh, it's a tale of two cities. People are very happy, Northern Queens, uh, Prime Avenue retail located near the train multifamily. Uh, head to South Queens, a little less desirable, not as much interest. So for, for the audience, you know, because I have people from the city, I have people from around the world, what is considered South Queens? Uh, I usually use Queens Boulevard as the dividing line, plus or minus. So Queens Boulevard and North, you know, Jackson Heights, Astoria, Long Island City, Sunnyside, Woodside, Elmhurst, Forest Hills, Regal Park, very, very, very desirable. We start going into the, you know, South Jamaica, or, you know, the Rockaways, you know, the, the market gets a little bit less. Wait like a second. Thing. Didn't I hear prior to the show that you were trying to sell Manny a property in the Rockaways? Manny owns property in, in the Rockaways. What's wrong with the Rockaways, Manny? I, I honestly think that is a sleeping lion, uh, the Rockaways. Where can you find waterfront properties in a place like New York City so cheap? I think it's a matter of time that uh, people will come to their senses and they'll find out that's the cheapest waterfront property you can find, not only in New York, in any big metropolitan area. Manny, I agree with you 100%, and I'm even gonna, since I'm a little older than some of the guys here, when, when I, and my viewers will not believe this, I was in the Army Reserve. And in the Rockaways, at the end of the Rockaways, there was a place called Fall Tilden, which is still there. And that was the Army Reserve. And I still remember that this was a neighborhood. I mean, the, you know, 
uh, Bell Harbor has in the Ponset. It was a wonderful area. And, you know, fortunately in the mid-90s, they did the restoration and there has been some renovation and, you know, with Beechwood and the others. It's the same beach as the Hamptons. It's the same water as the Hamptons. And it's so much more convenient. You don't have to schlep two and a half hours. I honestly think the sand is better than the Hamptons. The uh, accommodation is a lot more than Hamptons. If you want to take a train from Manhattan to Hampton, it takes you four hours to get there. You take the subway in New York City, you'll be in Rockaway Beach in 45 minutes. The, I think the, the fact that during certain times some elements affected the uh, local residents there, uh, is still some of that effect is there, but I think time, the same way that time cleared lo Lower East Side in Manhattan, Alphabet Town, 20 years ago, uh, you wouldn't dare to be there, but now it's the best part of Manhattan. Most expensive rental in Manhattan is now a lower yeah, side. And everybody wants to be in Alphabet City. Everybody wants to see that. But so, so here is the question. You know, I, I don't. Th I, I think what you're saying, and I think Elias will possibly agree. But I'm going to ask him: Is there any bad place in in the five boroughs today, in your own mind? I mean, you guys invest, Barry, and you look for properties. Do you think there's anything? I mean, everybody wants to be in Manhattan, but look, as you know, as, as Tommy just brought out, uh, you know, Astoria, Long Island City, these are areas those that are, are booming. Those are the best areas of Queens, and they do very well. But like he said, it is a sort of a tale of two cities. Southern Queens, because maybe it's proximity to transportation or... Yeah, I think you're different, right. A uh, little bit of a different demographic. It's not as valuable or as desirable. Thus, the rents are lower little softer, um, and thus the prices are lower. Okay. Now, now, we were talking before, Barry, you know, a little bit about uh, the Queens Boulevard, you know, and uh, I think you brought up mainly also about the retail, you know, with the Bukharians and the, uh, the Kotsky, you know, the, the Russians coming into the area. H how do you see rents today in Queens in the most prime properties in Queens? Well, I, I, I think as Elias said, it's, it's transportation proximity to Manhattan. Uh, areas like Sunnyside are absolutely on fire. You know, we're getting seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars for one bedrooms. Um, I looked at some numbers before I came in today. Uh, some apartments we rented 18 months ago, we're getting eight, nine percent more than we were, uh, you know, even a year and a half ago. So there's really, um, it was a very strong neighborhood to begin with, and there's continued remarkable growth. Um, but it is, there is a proximity to Manhattan. We do own stuff in Richmond Hill, which Tommy would probably consider Southern Queens. Um, and it's great stuff. It's a beautiful neighborhood, quiet, but we're not going to get the kind of rents. The transportation's not the same. The trip into Manhattan's a little bit more arduous. So, you, you, you know, we're seeing some of the same things. It's an interesting question, though, about it, are there any bad neighborhoods in, in New York anymore? Um, it's certainly less than it was. You know, the, the, we always joke around if somebody got off a plane and said, take me to the worst neighborhood in, Manhattan, in New York, where would you go? And I'm not really sure what the answer is anymore. So what's the best neighborhood in Queens, if you had to say? I mean, you know, Queens, how many residents are there, Mr. Donovan, in Queens? How many, how many people live in, in Queens? I think it's somewhere about a million and a half to two million people. So you have that large proximity, you have lots of retail, you, ha you have some great amenities. I mean, you know, there's museums, uh, there's restaurants, you know, the city field where they had a thousand people yesterday, let's forget about that. Uh, but I mean, wh where, you know, what's the, the best location and the most expensive with regard to residential? And I'm gonna ask Manny a, bit, a little bit about retail. I, I think, um, again, it's driven by, you know, as much as I love Queens, you know, we're, we're Queens guys, that's our base. Um, I think it's driven by Manhattan. The neighborhoods closest to Manhattan are the ones that do the best. Sunnyside, Jackson Heights, Astoria, th those are the neighborhoods that I think really, in, in terms of rents, those are the strongest rents. You know, I, I hear that, but I didn't hear Flushing. Flushing is also very strong. It's got a very big... Uh, immigrant population and uh, they have express trains from Flushing, they have the Long Island Railroad from Flushing, uh, so its proximity to the city is also very good. I mean, retail in Flushing is fantastic. I mean, <clears throat> when Musk built that new development, which, you know, he just got hurt a little bit because of the, of the, the timing for the co-ops, the condos, but the retail, it's, you know, you have BJ's, you have all that type of situation. So, 
t talk to me because you're a retail specialist, Manny. You know, even though that Barry and Elias have retail, how do you see retail in the borough of Queens today? I uh, honestly, even in the areas that residential could be marginal and the demographic is not good for uh, high rent apartments, you'd be surprised that there are many national tenants are starting for the first time to want to be in those marginal areas just because demographic there matches with their requirements. So what could be not a good residential area if you have the right property could be very good for retail. And I give you example of it. As they say South Queens, they said Jamaica. Jamaica Avenue, Sutphin Boulevard and Jamaica Avenue is some of the most expensive retail in Queens, uh, right in that around 160s. And that's again because people, if poor or rich, they have to shop. And it's just a matter of having the right retailer for them. So who's the retailers in, who are the best retailers in that type of market? The one who's growing the fastest that I see is a chain of uh, stores called Family Dollar. They have almost 9,000 stores and they have a competition which uh, is not exactly the same because they have a fixed price, which is called Dollar Tree. But Dollar Tree, because of the fact that they, they cannot sell, everything is a dollar or less, they, they, they are limited to what, how much rent they could pay. So they have a new concept, or it's not that new, they have some stores in New York now called Deals. And deal, that Deals store is owned by Dollar Tree, so basically they go to an area, they open a store of about 10,000 square feet, and they sell from frozen meat, milk, up to paper products, and whatever they could sell cheap. And that's what they are in the market now strongly. They're going to uh, demographic, as I said, they want to make sure they have enough people. That's the main goal. And there is a lot of food traffic. If they get that, then they really don't care if it is South Queens or North Queens. You know, you, you bring out an interesting thing. You know, you talk about Dollar Tree and deals. I think <clears throat> a very good example of a retailer moving into Queens was Aldi. Aldi is the sister company of Trader Joe's. And Aldi moved into the Bornado shopping center right off uh, the expressway, you know, where Home Depot is. Yes. And, and Aldi is the largest, uh, own, their own brand product. 97% of the products in the store are their own brand. And they are geared to the small urban area, sometimes a little mixed area, you know, neighborhood where they need food and they, they do well. Um, and they've opened up in New York, they really only have one store. Uh, they're over there and I think they opened them in the Bronx and Queens was their first store. So as a test, I think it gives an example. Your type of properties that you have, who, who's renting? Who, who are your tenants? What's the, uh, you know, um, because you know, what I think Barry brought out was, you know, people have to commute into the city and they, they move to Queens or Brooklyn because they're priced out of the market in Manhattan. It seems like it's a younger demographic that's moving into uh, most of our buildings. Uh, some of them coming from the city because they're being priced out of the city and they want to be near the train and they figure it's 20 minutes to their place of employment. But it's also new people coming in from out of state, um, recent graduates or people getting a new job coming to the city and they can't afford Manhattan. So it's a lot of uh, young people that are looking for jobs and have jobs in the city. You know, there was a recent study that came out with regard to uh, Aqueduct Racetrack. I, I mean, if, if you're familiar with how well Yonkers did with the Racino, you know, uh, the Aqueduct, they've had more people on the train going to Aqueduct than ever before because of that. Do you think perhaps, and maybe this is a good question for uh, Tommy specifically, but anyone else, that there will be new residential developments being built near Aqueduct? I think for, for that to happen, there may be, need to be some zoning changes. A lot of the zoning around the Aqueduct area is a low rise residential zoning geared towards the one to three family homes. But any neighborhood that's borderline on another more desirable neighborhood that the train extends through, I've seen a big influx of desirability and price increases 
both for retail and residential. Um, and if I can give you an example of that would be Ridgewood, Queens. Ridgewood, Queens is the extension of the Greenpoint Williamsburg train next to Bushwick, which had seen some height in the last you know, upturn in the market. They call it the Wick. The Wick, absolutely. And if you look now through R Ridgewood, Queens, the residential buildings are all cleaning up. But for the first time we're seeing, and Manny could attest, uh, we're seeing side block retail, not only from bodegas and candy stores, but actual dress shops, boutiques, family dollar coming in, and as well as you know, gentr a whole gentrification of the side blocks, not necessarily the main thoroughfares. I mean, the gentrification, you know, especially Long Island City. I mean, as we were talking about Tom Algany, and I had had him on my show ten years ago, and he, they, you know, they've been here for years. And I said, how come you never went to Long Island City? It, he says. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, wasn't the place. But today, Long Island City has retail. I, I mean, retail, you have some really good little restaurants and, you know, the, the, the shops over there. How, what, what's retail selling for? How, you know, well, you're an investment sales expert. What's the retail sites selling for in Queens today? You're talking about development sites? Development sites. And well, uh, for existing retail in, in the desirable neighborhoods, you could figure plus or minus about 275 to $300 per square foot. You go on some Austin Street, some parts of 37th Avenue, some parts of you know, Jamaica Center, that number can go as high as seven or $800 per square foot. So th there's a, you know, a very bifurcated box of where the retail falls. You're not seeing it less than 200 per foot, but if you figured about $300 per foot for the average neighborhood and then the major streets, major thoroughfares, probably going as high as four to five hundred dollars per foot on average. So here's a question for the guys who buy from you. And then we'll do you think prices are too high in Queens and in the city? I, I honestly I have uh, a lot of my colleagues and friends, they always want to own a piece of Manhattan. And my advice to them always have been that if I had a choice of a good location Manhattan or Queens, I would take the one in Queens. Because a good location in Queens, very rarely you see any vacancy. You see a lot of vacancy in good, good location in Manhattan. And I could give you examples of corner of 57 and Park Avenue sat vacant for a long time. I remember they filled up the store with balloons to get some attention to it. And uh, the expenses are so high in Manhattan, as well as the rents are so high because they paid so much for it that in order to have a decent so, so, return. So here's the question. Are prices becoming too high in Queens? Well, I guess the investors, you know, the investors who have been priced out of Manhattan want to invest. You know, my, I tell a great story that when did you think a Canadian REIT would go into Long Island City and buy Gotham Center? Two years ago, three years ago, it was unheard of. I mean, and they paid an outrageous sum. Four hundred sixty-five you know, million. Right. So you know, the, the world has changed. You know, investors are not saying that it has to be in Manhattan. They're ready to go to any of the five boroughs. You know, and as we say, maybe South Jamaica may not be the right thing, but there are Home Depots in South Jamaica that do very well. You know, in other situations. And Michael, I think in the residential part of our of, of our business, I think the the trick is now going back to Manhattan. And the reason I say that, and again, you have to understand, my father-in-law started in Queens and, you know, eight buildings in Sunnyside, that was our base, that's where we started. We love Queens. And, you know, 10 years ago, we would pay extra for Queens. You got, you, you got a better tenant who was more likely to pay the rent, put less wear and tear on the apartment. Uh, even landlord-tenant court was a much better place. And we, we love Queens. We thought it was an under-recognized borough, and that's where we focused our, our investments. I think what's happened is that, that the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, and now you're getting more and more people investing in Queens. And you know, we talked about it a little bit before. Tommy just uh, had a deal on the market. It was basically somewhere around a three and a half cap, um, to buy, with with not a ton of potential, from what I could tell. Um, my position is, if you're going to be buying three caps, I'd rather go to Manhattan and buy three caps. Um, you know, your expenses per unit are less. You know, your water and sewer is the same, but relative to your rent roll, it's going to be less. Your density is a little less, a little less wear and tear. Water and sewer is a little less. You know, it, it relates to a great story that Ophelia Denny said once on one of my panels when, when the 2008 recession came. 
He said, my tenants, you know, before they were working on Wall Street, they were never home, they never used, my, they never used the oil, they never used the gas range, they never took showers. Now they go to the gym, they have take, they, my expenses are there, they're much higher. And that's what I hear. Queens, they live at the house a little bit more, they don't go to the restaurants as much, so they stay and they cook at the house, so it costs me more to run the building. Right. It, I mean, I'm, I, that's what I'm hearing. It does, about. but that's true. A, a, and they're spending more money in the retail. The, but, no, but that's true that they, they spend more time and more, they use more utilities. But at the same time, your vacancies is a lot lower. In Queens, very, if you are, and, uh, it doesn't have to be any fancy neighborhoods. I could see apartments in Long Island City now, one bedroom apartments that they are renting close to $2,000 a month. One bedroom apartments in Astoria are renting $1,700, $1,800 a month. That's really close to Manhattan already. And one other thing that Queens has that uh, Manhattan doesn't, a lot of different ethnics that they come, especially from Europe, they like Queens. They like Astoria, they like Ridgewood. You go to Ridgewood now, it used to be, now you see Romanians, you see Polish. So, and they want to be next to each other. There is a Polish butcher there and there is a Polish real estate there. So they like to be in their own communities and that has stronger, many neighborhoods in Queens like Astoria and Ridgewood. How are the lenders looking with regard to providing you financing today for your properties in Queens? That's also a little bit of a tale of two cities because with the downturn that we just hopefully are coming out of now, uh, a lot of people got hurt and they fell behind on their mortgages. They didn't make all their payments. So a lot of lenders are very careful, but the guys that had multifamily product that was stable cash flow, instead of uh, not making the payments, all the payments were made, their banks are very happy to lend with them. And it's very competitive. The banks are making uh, loans in low threes right now. And uh, it seems like uh, there's a lot of banks that want to make the loan. So, so here's my question. As, as, as borrowers, are you taking advantage and are you recommending to, you know, well, but, uh, let, to, to, for lower? Yeah, Barry. Let, let me answer. Let me, Tommy's deal is a great, great example. So you're, so you're buying, a, a, say, a three and a half cap, and you're going out, and as Elias says, you're getting sub, you know, maybe three and a half percent financing for, say, five years. The problem with buying a low cap deal like a three and a half cap is what happens in five years? Uh, you know, I don't know what interest rates are going to be, but I'm pretty sure they're not going to be 3.5% in five years. So the question becomes, you buy a deal with a 35 you work it, you get some, up, you get some turnover, you, you increase some rents, you get it up to, say, a 5% return, and then you have to go back out into the, in, into the mortgage market in five years. If rates are 6, you're, gonna, you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to have, you know, you're going to be behind on the leverage. So it, it creates, an, once the cap rates start getting down to that 3.5%, I get a little nervous. There's not much margin for error. Elias? I agree. There's some risk involved that uh, you're going to be treading water or possibly falling behind, depending on what the uh, interest rates are, are going to be doing in the next few years. See, my, my but, comment, and I said this, I've said it publicly on panels and shows, I think that, you know, and it could be in Queens, it could be in any of the boroughs, I believe rents in certain markets have reached truly the max. You know, the, how much higher can they go? As we said prior to the show, some rents in Manhattan and Queens are exceeding the 2007 all-time highs. So how, you know, how much can somebody pay of their, of their income to pay rent? You know, you know, how many more people could you put in the apartment? You know, uh, that, that's, the, that's the question. Then the water will be used too much also. You know, so we you know, have to cut the water pressure and everything else. But, you know, that, that is the problem. Can I had a comment. Um, yeah, that's what it kind of goes along with what the gentleman was just saying. One, one nice of the things call them gentlemen. One of the things you need to take <laughs> into account is that Queens of all the boroughs has the lowest vacancy rate and lowest turnover rate. It hovers somewhere around one percent. So if you have average rents that are you know a thousand eleven hundred dollars, and the you know the downside of a tenant leaving, there's, there's only one way to go is up. Even if the expenses are raising, you know you you kind of want that turnover. And people you know they're well under that luxury decontrol threshold, so you. You have less of a churn of the apartments, so if the tenant does leave, even though you're paying at three percent, you don't have that four or five thousand dollar month rent that's going to come back in at three thousand per month. It's a nine hundred or a thousand dollar rent that hopefully is going to relet, even if it's at a discount rent at fifteen or sixteen hundred. I have a question. Yes, sir. You grew up in Queens. I did. 
Oh, okay. You know, I, I just was wondering why. You know, I always in the, the pro Brooklyn because I'm the Brooklyn boy over here. You know, on this situation, um, with regard to you know, how many sites are left for a development today to be built in Queens for residential development? Well, ag again, you know, a, a lot of the neighborhoods, you know, they rezone a, a few of them. So, you know, a good portion of Jamaica, there's still some sites left. Long Island City, although the, you know the buildings are sprouting up, there's still quite a few left. Um, a lot of, you know, there are some in the story, but uh, you know, not, not as many, some in, a, in Sunnyside, but not as many. You know, a lot of the other neighborhoods have a low density zoning. It's harder to find places to put, you know, a 30, 40 unit building. So you're seeing more of the boutique, you know, 10, 12,000 foot little boutique buildings going up. So the, you know, the, the sexier dynamic, more of a dynamic building, there's very few sites left. Here's something that I, I failed to bring out. I mean, I hear, Retail, I hear residential. Have you guys gone into the conversion of residential to condominiums? Elias? We, we've done a, a recent, uh, not so recent, it's, a, it's probably about three, four years ago now, uh, conversion. It was a rent stabilized building that we were able to completely vacate. And um, we've converted it to condominiums. It was in a neighborhood called Orbindale, it was North Flushing. We called it Bayside West, thinking maybe. Well, I'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> thinking we could get some of the Bayside demographic, which was uh, a little bit better. But being it was very close to the railroad, we sold out 100%. All of the. And what type of were, price? Were sold per foot. Out. Um, the price per square foot was probably around uh, $600 a square foot. And have you ever uh, we, with, your well, buildings? We have some uh, co-ops that we did in the in the uh, mid '80s, so that we've we've owned them forever. Uh, we still have a few unsold shares left. Um, I'm not a huge fan of doing uh, condo co-ops in Queens right now. I think, you know, in selected areas it might make sense. Um, I think the demand is a little bit thin and that um, you can sell, but you're, you're not going to have 20 people uh, coming and do, looking at an open house if you have a unit. So I, I, I would be very careful of it. Um, you know, we have something in the city right now. We're doing some, we, we've bought some unsold co-op units. Um, and we're doing very well with those, um, but I'm much more reluctant to get involved in Queens. Right, those were the Gramercy Park uh, units. Yes, the, yeah, Kipps Bay. Kipps Bay, yeah, Gramercy. Right. It depends on who wrote the article. Right, I wish it was Gramercy uh, Park. They Kipps Bay, but Kips the article Bay. in right. real there said uh, Gramercy. Right. So I, I think, you know, uh, I think what we really, uh, due to the efforts of my executive producer, have put together, uh, you know, a pretty good insight on what's happening in the borough of Queens. You know, perhaps if... Uh, Mets play a little better, you know, maybe more people will be there. But otherwise, I'd like to thank Barry, Manny, Elias, and Tommy. See you next week.